And to the angel of the church at Laodicea, write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you are either cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined by the fire, so that you may be rich in white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I, repro I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent, and behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered, and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You may be seated. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of your word your Bible, your letter to us. I pray that as we explore what you've written here, that you would keep all of our hearts and minds open, that if there is something here for us, that we would be paying attention, that we would catch it, and that we would go forward in our week changing what we need to change and living the way that we need to live in order to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. I once heard a story about a mother who was preparing dinner for her family, and at the same time she was preparing cookies. She thought they might want dessert. And the kids were in the kitchen causing a bunch of chaos and asking for some of the cookie dough, and the, the husband was in the living room watching TV, not really engaging, not really helping, not really doing a whole lot of anything. And the kids kept asking, Mom, Mom, can we, can we have a look at the cookie dough? Can we have a look at the cookie dough? We'll be good for a look of cookie dough. We'll eat our dinner. We'll be good. And this kept going, and they were more and more persistent, and finally the mom reached her limit, and she said, Enough! Go in the living room, join your dad, and be good for nothing. <laughs> and, as easy as that might be to laugh at, imagine that being your marriage, your relationship. And imagine the emotional dryness and the tension in that relationship. Keep those feelings and those thoughts in mind as we go forward because I think that will help you to understand what Jesus is saying to the church at Laodicea in this letter. Another story, this one's from Aesop's Fables, is about a dog who had a bone. This is a very nice bone. He's very happy about his bone. And as he is walking, he walks across a mud puddle and slows down for a second and looks down and he sees his reflection. But not knowing that's his reflection because he's a dog and doesn't know that, he just sees another dog with another bone. And he decides that the bone that dog has is better than the bone that he has, and so he lets go of the bone that he has to try to get that one. And of course, his bone falls in the mud and now is not so appealing. And a lot like that dog, the church at Laodicea had been fooled by a counterfeit. They had given up the real thing for the fake thing. So to make this make a little more sense, let's understand a little bit of Laodicea's cultural context. The city of Laodicea was a very, very important and extremely wealthy trade center, kind of like our modern day New York in a sense. It was located at the intersection of one of the main east-west highways and one of the main north-south highways. And because of this location, it was home to a very important banking center pretty much the New York Stock Exchange of the Roman Empire. And in fact, from about 62 BC, it had also functioned as Rome's Fort Knox because it is illegal to export gold from Laodicea and the gold that was in Laodicea was used to back the Roman currency. They were a very rich, very affluent, very well-off community. And this wealthiness, this affluence was one of the markers of their cultural identity. The pagan gods worshipped in Laodicea included the emperors. They did a lot of emperor worship. They worshipped Zeus, Apollo, and one in particular named Asclepius, the healer. 
And because of their temple to Asclepius the healer, they had also a medical school that was very well known that had developed a particular eye salve, something to heal various different eye ailments and to help return sight for those who were losing it. And you can guess that because of the economic inflexibility of the time, if you were blind, there wasn't really a possibility of finding work for you. They had disability but no social security, and so blindness meant you couldn't work. So for somebody who had been working and was losing their job or losing their livelihood because they could no longer see, this ISAV was in demand, and it was exported all over the world. Another key export that they had is a very shiny, soft, black wool, the quality and texture of which no shepherds anywhere else in the world had been able to match. And so this black wool was also in very high demand. So you have the banking commerce, you have the export of this medical, the ISAV, you have the medical school there, and you have the export of this black wool. These are three things that were a part of the cultural identity of Laodicea. There's one other that we'll get to shortly. Something happened in AD 60. They, they, uh, they experienced an earthquake that leveled most of the city. And rather than accepting help from the Roman emperor, this is a very important tax revenue and financial asset for Rome, so he wanted that city built back up so he could continue getting tax revenue from it. But rather than accepting help, they decided to rebuild it themselves and they rebuilt it better than it had been before. So as we're reading these letters to the churches in Revelation, this is, materially speaking, the wealthiest church in the book of Revelation. But spiritually speaking, this is the poorest church in the book of Revelation. In this, the biblical context of this letter, the, the letter that precedes it, is the one to Philadelphia. And in the letter to, church, to the church at Philadelphia, there's one of two churches that Jesus only has good things to say about. He has nothing bad to say about them. Of the seven churches, four of them get mixed news, good and bad. Two of them get only good news, Smyrna and Philadelphia. And one of them gets only bad news. And it's Laodicea. Following... The uh, letter to the church at Laodicea is a description of the throne room of heaven. And if you were paying attention, there's a connection from the end of this letter right into that, that description of heaven. So there's an easy transition there. And last, this is the seventh letter. Now, there are a whole lot more than just seven churches in the world at that time. But because of the symbolic significance of the number seven in biblical literature... There's a symbol of completeness. Any church anywhere would have something similar about them to one of the churches in these letters. And likewise, any individual Christian anywhere would have something similar about them to one of these churches. As a whole, the theme of the book of Revelation is to see Christ revealed to the church as he presently is and as he will be when he returns. And the purpose of those seven letters within the book of Revelation is to reveal Christ to those churches as they need to see and understand Him so that they can continue what they're doing if it's good or correct what they're doing if it's bad. To quote John Piper, this is a harsh letter, this one, is a harsh letter to a church that is content with itself and feels the need of nothing. So jumping in, to the main text, to the angel of the church at Laodicea, write the words of the Amen. It might seem strange to hear the Amen because we don't usually think of Amen as a thing. We usually think of Amen as kind of an attitude or a sense of agreement. When we pray, we usually get to the end of our prayer and we say, in Jesus' name, Amen. We are agreeing with that prayer and saying, let it be made so. But Jesus says, I am the Amen. I'm not just agreeing with all of the prayers and all of the promises and all of the prophecies throughout Scripture. I am the fulfillment of those prophecies. I am that prayer coming true. I am the climax, the culmination, the fulfillment, and the pinnacle of redemptive history. 
we close our prayers by saying, essentially, let it be so. But God is starting this letter by saying, I am so. This is in contrast to the church at Laodicea and their attitude of self-sufficiency. They thought they had arrived. They thought that they had no more work to do. And Jesus is basically saying, I'm the one who's arrived. You have work to do. So if we take that to heart, we should never fool ourselves into thinking that we've arrived and that we have no more work left to do. We can also look at another letter that John wrote. 1 John 1, 8, it says, If we say that we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Cleansing of sin and sanctification, as it is called, is a constant part of the Christian life, and it is never done until we die and go to meet Jesus in eternity. The words of the Amen. The faithful and true witness. This faithful and true is in contrast to Laodicea's laziness and inauthenticity. Jesus is faithful, not lazy. Jesus is true and authentic, not inauthentic. And in fact, to be firm, faithful, true, and trustworthy is the original meaning of the word, Amen. And so there's two things happening here. When Jesus says the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, he is defining, for those who are unfamiliar with the word, Amen, and he is repeating the same thing. In the Bible, repetition is emphasis. There's no bold or italic or underlined print. So by defining and repeating this, he's making this point very strong. I am the Amen. I am the faithful and true witness in contrast to this church at Laodicea. Jesus re reveals himself as a witness. He's the Amen. He's faithful and true. And he says, I'm the witness. I'm, I am the faithful and true witness. All of this is in contrast to Laodicea's uselessness as a witness. They think they've arrived, they're lazy, they're inauthentic, and they are a useless witness. They are doing nothing to build the kingdom of God. So if we take this to heart, we should say, okay, just as we should seek to be holy because Jesus is holy, so we should also seek to be faithful and true witnesses as Jesus is the faithful and true witness. The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. The Arians in the 4th century and the, the Jehovah's Witnesses today take this verse and they say, gee, Jesus was the beginning of God's creation. He must have been the first and the mightiest of all of God's created things. And that's wrong. Jesus was not created. If we consider this, this odd word here, this odd idea, the beginning of God's creation, with the rest of the book of Revelation, we would see this is wrong. In Revelation chapter 5, Jesus is worshipped by all of creation. And in Revelation chapter 19, the worship of a created thing is forbidden. So Jesus cannot be a created thing because he is worshipped by all of creation. More so in the Gospel of John, written by the same guy, we read in the very first opening paragraph, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made. So if we're taking the totality of the Bible into account, Jesus was not the beginning, but the source, or the chief of God's creation. And there are other English translations that actually use those words instead of the beginning. What Jesus is saying here is, I didn't start with creation. I was here before creation. He's laying out his credentials for the church at Laodicea as the one who is co-eternal with God without beginning, the Amen, the faithful and true witness. He's laying out his credentials to bring this really, frankly, bad news that he is about to bring to the church at Laodicea. The next thing that he says is, I know your works. He has said this to several of the other churches before, but 
usually what has followed is a commendation, a, a praising of the things that they're doing good. No such thing happens here. Jesus says, I know your works and I have nothing good to say about you. The Greek word here is Edo. I Edo your works. I see inside and out. I know every motive, good or bad. And I know every fruit that is produced by your works, whether it is the fruit that you think is produced or the fruit that really is produced. I know your works, and I have nothing good to say about them. If you look back at 1 Samuel chapter 16, the story of the anointing of David to be the king of Israel, Samuel learns that God sees the heart while man sees the outside. And this message... This church at Laodicea needs to be reminded of this message. If we do what we do for human recognition, instead of to glorify God, God knows our heart. He knows we're phony. But if we do what we do to glorify God, God knows our heart. And He knows we're real. So depending on your attitude, depending on your approach to what you are doing to build the kingdom of God, this can be either encouraging... Or discouraging. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. Or I wish you were either cold or hot. Very often today this is interpreted and applied as God saying, I wish you were either for me or against me instead of ambivalent, ambivalent and indifferent. But I don't think that's how the Laodiceans would have heard it. As much as commerce and the export of their wool and the export of their ISAV were positive pieces of the identity of the city, there was one very negative piece of their identity, and that was their water. As large as this city was, they had no ready source of drinking water. The local rivers the Meander and the, and the Lycus River would dry up at different times of the year or freeze over. In addition, no matter which river or stream you looked at, Laodicea was downstream from other cities. So the water that they got from those streams was very dirty. Their solution to their water problem was to build an aqueduct. These big three-foot stones, they'd drill a big hole through it and they'd stack them in line and bring water in from the other cities that they could drink. So they thought. In fact, the stones that they had used imparted new chemicals to the water that once the water got to Laodicea, it was so tainted with these chemicals, it would induce vomiting as soon as they tried to drink it. Much like when you travel to Mexico and they tell you not to drink the water. Another issue about this lukewarmness thing is that Hierapolis, one of the cities they may have drawn water from, to the north, had hot springs that they were known for using for medicinal effects. This hot water at Hierapolis had a healing effect. Colossae, about 10 miles to the east and a little bit south, had, was fed by a cool mountain stream. Crisp, clear, cool mountain water. Refreshing. So, on the cold side, there's refreshment. On the hot side, there's healing. For the purposes of being a useful witness, Laodicea is providing neither refreshment to the spiritually weary, nor healing to the spiritually wounded. They are a useless witness. One of the commentators on this verse also pointed out that really, if Laodicea was cold, they would have had a sense of need for God. It's cold outside today, and if any of you were cold and, or outside, you would be cold and you would have a sense of wanting to be inside where it's warm. This is not God saying to Laodicea, I wish you were either for or against me. He's saying, I wish you had a sense of your need for me and I wish that you were a useful witness. Either healing the spiritually wounded or refreshing the spiritually exhausted. Christians with the Laodicean heart and churches with the Laodicean attitude are no more useful to God's kingdom than that good-for-nothing husband. 
and they are no more appreciative of the blessings that they have in front of them than that dog from Aesop's fables. These Christians keep Christ at arm's length. They want to be around Him, in the same room as Him, near Him somewhat, but not personally and intimately close to Him. The next thing that Jesus says is so that because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. The word translated as spit can also mean to vomit or to puke. To borrow from Dr. Rosertia over in Portland, how bad does a church have to be for God to tell them, you nauseate me? As rich as Laodicea was, they had no drinking water. They had no usable water. They had to boil it. There wasn't a ready source of it. Water is critical to life, and what is being said here is just as critical as your water is to your physical life, so your sense of need for God and your passion for God is critical to you becoming a Christian. And so your refreshment and your healing provided to the people around you is critical to your sense, to your ability to be used as a witness. The curious people who weren't quite yet Christians in the church at Laodicea were indifferent. They had no sense of their need for God, and the Christians who were there were providing no useful effect for the spreading of the gospel and the building of God's kingdom. And God says, I will vomit you out because you make me sick. Now, if we, if we hear that and say, well, you're, they must have lost their salvation, then that's inconsistent with other parts of the Bible. To quote John Piper, he says, the faith, the faith that saves is not a lukewarm, half-hearted faith. Some of these people were not even saved yet. The useful witness is an uncomfortable witness. These people had I'd been, been treating their comfort and their affluence as an idol. What God is saying is, you are so unhealthy as Christians and as a church that if there was a line where you could lose your salvation, you're right there. This is a very severe warning to the Christians. The Westminster Larger Catechism, it might sound like a funny name, but it's a document. Catechism means collection of questions and answers. Westminster is the place where it was written. Cites this verse when answering the question, what sins are forbidden by the first commandment? The first commandment is to have no idols. And lukewarmness is considered a violation of that commandment. So what is the idol of the, the lukewarm Christian but their comfort and their affluence? And in fact, that's the next thing that Jesus says. For you say, I am rich. I've prospered and I need nothing. For Christ who has revealed himself as the Amen and the, the one who has arrived and the one who has culminated redemptive history pointing out this arrogant, self-sufficient attitude of Laodicea, this is something to get their attention. Laodicea has acted as if it has arrived and has no work left to do. Christ has revealed himself as the faithful and true witness, but Laodicea has shown themselves to be lazy and inauthentic. They said, we have health, wealth, and prosperity. Why do we need God? Why do we need to share God? Of all of the possible threats to the church at Laodicea, whether it was persecution from the outside or false doctrines from the inside, the threat that Laodicea had fallen to was materialism. Or as it is called later in the book of Revelation, the whore of Babylon. And this, idolat this idolatrous attitude towards material things caused the church at Laodicea to be taken off track to the point where they were completely useless to the kingdom of God. This is what a checklist approach to Christianity does. I went to church. I read my Bible. 
I prayed. I've done all I needed to do. And then the checklist goes back in the junk drawer until next Sunday. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. If you were paying attention, you heard the other three pieces, the three good pieces of Laodicea's identity there. And Jesus is here saying, those aren't worth anything. You are wretched and pitiable and poor, not rich. You are blind despite your eye salve, and you are naked despite your amazing black wool. This is a humiliating slap in the face. This is the full exposure of Laodicea's arrogance. Proverbs 3.34, James 4.6, and 1 Peter 5.6 all say exactly the same thing. God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. So if we deceive ourselves into believing that we have arrived, then we end up in that very same position of pride where Laodicea was. God is here contrasting Laodicea's physical state with their spiritual state. Another old Christian document, the 1560 Scottish Confession of Faith, gives us reason to take comfort in this slap in the face. It explains, it cites this verse to explain the ways that the Holy Spirit wakes us up to our spiritual need, wakes us up to the reality of our spiritual blindness, and wakes us up to the reality of our sinful nature and our need of God. Essentially, when our basic physical needs are met, we are completely unaware of our need of God. And this is one of the ways... Uh, this verse is one of the ways that God reaches through Scripture, grabs us by the shoulder, and shakes us awake. This is also the bottom of the hole for Laodicea. This is the bottom of the slapping and the correction. And now starts the encouragement. As much as Jesus has been yelling at them, essentially, in the previous verses, He now says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by the fire, so that you may be rich. As much as Jesus has yelled at them, now he speaks to them as a counselor, speaking gently, with an encouraging voice. Buy from me pure gold, so that you can be rich. Now wait a minute. We've already established Laodicea is spiritually poor. They have nothing with which to buy this gold. So what is the currency? What is the thing that they will give in exchange for this gold? Jesus is fully aware of this. This is pointing back to Isaiah 55, 1, where the Lord says, Come, anyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. How do you buy anything when you're broke? What's God saying? He has shaken Laodicea awake to the fact of their need. And this is the thing that will fill that need, is coming to God. But what is the thing that we give in exchange? It's ourselves, completely and without reservation. You don't do business with God because you have anything to give. You do business with God because you need Him. And what is the greatest commandment? but to love God with the entirety of our being. Love God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. To be hot and passionate for Him instead of lukewarm and dispassionate. And then, as a result of your love for God, to love your neighbor as yourself, to be cool and compassionate towards them. I counsel you, buy from me pure gold refined by the fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Despite the Laodicean black wool being sold all over the world for clothes and for carpets and for textiles, the church at Laodicea was naked and shameful. 
The white here is a symbol for heavenly purity and for righteousness, neither of which were things that Laodicea was producing. And similar to the gold, the emphasis here is on the spiritual need, not the self-sufficiency of the worldly, rich Laodiceans. Here again, Christians with the Laodicean attitude and with the Laodicean heart, they do not have the comfort and prosperity that they perceive themselves to have physically, but they have spiritual nakedness, shame, and a desperate need for God. Jesus says, As spiritually naked and shameful as you are, come to me and I will clothe you so that I can take away your shame. Buy from me gold refined by the fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Jesus is still hammering on, the, on every point of need for the Laodicean church. This is Jesus re reaching through John's letter and violently grabbing them by the shoulders. Wake up! Wake up. You'd need me. Your attitude about your physical condition can distract you from your, from your need for God. So I pray that that would not be the case for any of us, that we would not be distracted by our physical condition. We need God's vision to see the reality of our need, and we need, God, we need God's vision to to see what we need to do. Jesus is saying, as spiritually blind as you are, come and give yourself to me, and I will make you see. And those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. One of the commentators here says, the verses that have preceded this are indeed one of the sharpest rebukes in the whole Bible. And then Jesus follows all of that with, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Talk about tough love. Culturally, talk about intolerance. What is the chief value in our culture except tolerance? You can't tell anyone that what they're doing is wrong and not in their best interest because you just must be intolerant. But that is exactly what Jesus has just done to the church at Laodicea. And without God's tough love and without God's intolerance of this attitude and this lukewarmness, where would some of us be? I can tell you that I personally would be well on my way to being spit out because this is the area where I tend to go when I am not in check. Of all of the churches in Revelation, this is the one where I am weak if I'm not being kept in check. I tend to be lukewarm. But this is what Jesus says. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Back to that Westminster larger catechism, that collection of questions and answers. One of the questions asks, how does Christ execute the office of a king? And one of the answers listed is by correcting his elect for their sins. And it cites this verse and another one. Hebrews 12, 6 through 7. It says, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there for whom his father does not discipline? For those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So... Be zealous and repent. The cure for this attitude of lukewarmness is first repentance and then zeal. Repentance is to turn away from the sin. And the zeal is not to crawl or walk away from the sin, but to run away from it and to run towards God. Now that Jesus has shaken Laodicea and shaken us awake to the nature and the depth of our spiritual need, He tells us what to do. So instead of being a useless witness, we can become faithful and true witnesses. And behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
In the church at Laodicea, Jesus had been pushed outside of the fellowship and no one had missed him. He's knocking on the door of the church saying, I want back in. I want to be a part of your fellowship. I want to be a part of your worship. And to the individual Christians, or Christians to be, he's saying, I want into your life. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, if anyone hears my voice, now, in the, in the previous verse, Jesus has said, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. And I think that specification applies here. Those whom, I reprove, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline and knock on the door of their hearts. So to hear His voice is to hear the correction that He would give to our lives, to hear the, the reproof that He would give to our attitudes, and to be aware of our need for Him. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and, he, and eat with him and he with me. This has been called the candlelit dinner in, with Jesus in the innermost room of your heart. So think of this. How, how different is that experience from the half-hearted, kept-at-a-distance relationship with Jesus? I think I'm okay to use a marriage analogy here because the Bible of course, calls the church the Bride of Christ. And in fact, later in Revelation, John describes for us a, an invitation to a heavenly wedding reception between Jesus Christ and His Bride, the church. So if your marriage was dry and passionless, the fix, or at least the first step to fixing things, would be to go on a date, have some time together, Maybe even stay up late when you get home and see what happens the next day, see what changes the next day. And just as that date is the fix or a first step to fixing the marriage, so letting Jesus into the innermost room of our hearts is the fix for lukewarm Christianity. This intimacy with Jesus is, will, is what will make you a useful witness. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit on my throne, to sit with me on my throne as I conquered and sat down with my Father on his throne. The thing that Jesus Christ conquered, of course, is sin and death. The thing for us to conquer is the idolatry of comfort and this attitude of lukewarmness. The reward is heaven. Heaven where Jesus is and where the Father is. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the general call to all of the churches at the end of each letter. This is not an issue about your ear or your sense of hearing. This is a call to carefully contemplate what has been said. He who has an ear, he who has the sense to listen... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Even though each of these individual churches, corporately and on average, needed to hear the specific thing that was said in their letter, there may have been individual Christians in each of those congregations that benefited and grew more from hearing the letter to another church than they did from hearing the letter to their own. So to borrow again from Dr. Azurdia over in Portland, is Jesus talking to Laodicea? Or is he talking to us? Is he talking to us, the church in the United States? Is he talking to Parkside Church? Or is he talking to you and I as individual Christians? And if he is talking to you and I as individual Christians, what do we need to do about it? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for your word and for you making yourself known to us through the Bible and through the ages. And I pray that as we go into our week, we would be convicted and encouraged by this message, that whatever we need to change, we might change, that we might glorify you more. In Jesus' name, amen.